It's a distinct pleasure to welcome Daniel Kalina um, to campus. He's a postdoc at uh, Princeton, did his PhD and master's at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, undergrad at Caltech um, in electrical engineering kind of all the way through. Um, and Daniel is here as a candidate for the data science position and applied math, which is an area that we're building in. And with that, I'll hand it over. Okay, thank you for coming, and uh, thanks for the invitation. Please uh, stop me at any time with questions. I'd love to uh, interact with you during the talk. Okay, I'm gonna be talking about information theoretic foundations of learning, applications to privacy and security. So I'll be talking about two different projects here. So there are these two gigantic trends uh, in the modern world of technology. Uh, one of these is widespread data collection. So uh, there are all these aspects of life now where users are interacting with some entity, and that entity is uh, keeping track of all the data being generated by this process. And uh, so we have this long list of examples here. Whenever someone is taking actions on the internet, taking financial actions, uh, in some cases, uh, interacting with the medical system in some way. Data is being generated. It's very valuable, and it's being stored. The second big trend is this rise of automated decision systems in, again, in almost every conceivable application. And these trends uh, are reinforcing each other. So the collection of all this data enables and improves these decision-making systems. So that's one direction. And the ability to have these uh, automated, relatively accurate, and importantly, very cheap decision-making systems enable new products, new points of interactions with users, new places where data ends up being gathered. So this is very self-reinforcing. It's been going on for uh, a few decades now, and it's uh, very fast-moving these days. OK. So this raises a lot of challenges. So first, uh, some challenges related to privacy from this uh, broad phenomenon. So obviously, a lot of this information being collected uh, is very sensitive. And import, uh, one thing that uh, many people interacting with these systems probably don't realize is the, the ability to make non-obvious inferences by combining these different sources of data, or even just by putting together many, many, many small bits of information uh, to learn something uh, interesting. So another challenge is that this data is being gathered by a large number of independently acting entities. They all have their own uh, incentives and goals and uh, money-making strategies. And naturally, as this data is collected by one entity, it might be valuable to another entity and so there are these incentives to exchange or share or sell data. And there's potentially conflicts between these economic incentives to uh, exchange data and build more accurate systems uh, in conflict with users' expectations about what uh, different entities should know about uh, sensitive aspects of their lives. There's also a second set of challenges related to uh, security and learning. So machine learning systems are being applied to every domain that anyone can think of at this point. And this includes uh, very, very important uh, safety-critical systems where the decisions being made by automated systems have uh, uh, high-impact consequences. Like two examples of these are autonomous vehicles and uh, the use of machine learning to make medical decisions. So because of the uh, safety critical aspect of these applications, it's important to really understand when decisions can be trusted and when they can't be. So a second issue is that in sort of the basic uh, data generation model used in machine learning and even in classical statistics, data comes from some natural source. And it might be time varying, it might have all kinds of complicated properties, 
but in a certain sense, it's fixed and doesn't change in response to uh, the actions you take to learn from that source. And this assumption is just wildly uh, untrue in a lot of modern systems. These systems are making consequential decisions uh, based on data generated by self-interested users. So the users are incentivized to shape the data that they provide in a way that affects the decision that's made. So this is a very, very uh, broad issue and it arises in, in many of the applications on the list that I, that I gave. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about uh, the toolkit that I bring to approaching these problems. So I apply uh, information theoretic uh, and statistical tools to inference problems. Mo uh, and these inference problems are motivated by the privacy and security concerns that I raised here. And so the basic, uh, the information theoretic approach is to identify the fundamental performance limits in this problem. Uh, and these can be limits in the quality of data that you need to make accurate decisions or the amount of data that you need to make accurate decisions. And the mathematical toolkit that uh, is used here involves uh, information measures, information inequalities, uh, taking advantage of the concentration of measure phenomenon, large deviations theory, and, and more. So my work is at the intersection of uh, these apply this applied math approach to problems with these very practical motivations. Okay, so the work that I'm going to be talking about uh, in this talk falls into two broad categories. So first, uh, I'm going to talk about this uh, privacy-motivated problem of graph alignment. Uh, there's a closely related problem that I'll only just have time to briefly mention called database alignment. Then uh, at the end of my talk, I'm going to talk about a, a problem in security of machine learning. Okay, so first, uh, let's uh, start with this privacy problem. Okay, so remember I said there's a large number of independent actors collecting data in the modern world. And in many cases, they'd like to publish it, share it, or sell it. But we'll assume that they're being altruistic and ethical here. And they'd like to do a, uh, they'd like to succeed at this on anonymization task. So one problem is that information about these same users has also been collected by other entities. How does that affect the ability of this data collector to anonymize their data? So one issue is that correlations between these data sets can facilitate de-anonymization even from a, uh, even when a data collector is trying to do everything right to protect the privacy of their users. Okay, so an important feature uh, from this point of view ends up being the structure of the data being collected. Some, uh, there's lots of other ways to categorize data, but for this problem, this is, this is the natural one. Some data points are naturally associated with a single user. Some data points represent the interaction between a user and uh, a fixed non-anonymous object. And some uh, data points represent interactions between multiple, uh, multiple users that we'd like to simultaneously anonymize. And these give rise to different, uh, the, the problems of de-anonymizing these types of data give rise to different alignment problems. So we call the first one database alignment. And the one that I'm going to spend the most time talking about today is this last one, graph alignment, about interaction, uh, data involving interactions between users. OK, so here's the, the problem formulation for graph alignment. So we have a pair of random graphs. And initially, we're going to think of these random graphs as having the same vertex set. So this is, this is a simplifying assumption, but uh, it makes the essence of the problem clear here. OK, the graphs are, what does it mean that the graphs are correlated? What it means is that if an edge is present in one graph, it's more likely to be present in the other graph. If it's absent in one graph, it's more likely to be absent in the other graph. Now here, I have the correspondence between the, the vertices represented by the colors. When the graphs are anonymized, we'd like to eliminate 
this uh, information. So assume that we don't know the vertex correspondence because someone has attempted to anonymize this data. Can we recover that correspondence based only on the structural correlations? That is the alignment problem. So here's a, I'm just going to introduce a tiny bit of notation to formalize this. So we have the, the vertex sets of these two graphs. The most important parameter in this problem is the number of vertices. The relationship between the vertices is this matching. It's a subset of pairs of vertices. And this is the unknown object that we'd like to estimate. And the correlation comes from this conditional probability distribution. So we, the input here is a matching, and the output is a pair of correlated graphs. So we get the pair of correlated graphs. We'd like to estimate the matching. When can we solve this estimation problem? I'm going to ask questions about the information theoretic limit, or the statistical limit. And this, uh, so this is going to put no restriction on the amount of computational resources that our algorithm is required to use. So this is a, this is a conservative assumption from a privacy point of view. We're assuming that the person trying to learn things from our data is either uh, very smart or extremely has uh, access to a large number of resources or is willing to work very hard. So the two questions, two, uh, two questions you can ask here. When can we exactly recover mu? Second, if that's impossible, when can we still learn almost everything about mu? So now I'm going to talk about uh, this uh, data generating probability distribution here. So we start with basically the simplest possible joint distribution on correlated graphs. And this is the correlated Erdos-Renyi distribution. So in the Erdos-Renyi distribution, each edge random variable is an, an independent indicator, and the edge is present with uh, some probability. So suppose we have this Erdos-Renyi graph G, and that for each edge, that probability is uh, some number R. We're going to generate two random subgraphs of G. We're going to keep all of the vertices in both graphs. We're going to keep edges with some, uh, we're going to subsample edges with some subsampling probability. So if the edge is present in the parent graph, it will be present in the child graph GA with probability SA. If it's not present in the parent graph, it is definitely not present in the child graph. The same thing independently for GB. We do this uh, subsampling independently across, ed across edges and graphs. And so this uh, gives us exactly the situation that I described uh, two slides ago. If an edge is present in GA, it's more likely to be present in GB because we know that the edge, if it's present in GA, we know that it was present in the parent graph G. And so, that's, so that uh, leads to the increased probability for GB. OK, and then the anonymization process is just relabeling these vertices using uh, the matching mu. So now they're on two different vertex sets, UA and UB. OK, so how does this relate to problems that people have thought about before? So graph alignment is the noisy version of the extremely well-studied graph isomorphism problem. So if we uh, take these subsampling probabilities to be 1, the two graphs are just identical to each other. And in this case, we can learn the alignment uh, we can recover the alignment exactly when the, with the, the graph has a trivial automorphism group. When it doesn't have a trivial automorphism group, we can only learn it up to that group, up, up to an element of that group. So in 1971, uh, Wright showed he found the precise condition for when erdos renyi graphs have a trivial automorphism group. And he was interested in the problem of counting the number of unlabeled graphs. And so he showed that when the average degree in an erdos renyi graph is a little bit more than log n, so log n plus some function that goes to infinity, uh, then the automorphism group will be trivial with high probability. And with high probability in this talk means with just with probability uh, approaching 1 as n goes to infinity. So uh, I don't know how many people are familiar with random graph theory, but one thing you might notice here is this is the same threshold for the graph becoming connected. It's uh, the same condition on degree. When the average degree becomes log n, the graph becomes connected. It also uh, uh, has a trivial automorphism group. OK, 
So one natural strategy to evaluate whether a candidate alignment is likely to be the true alignment is to look at something called the aligned intersection that you get there. So if you just look at this picture here, I've got these two graphs. And if you look at the colors, this is like a, a proposed way of matching each vertex in graph A with a corresponding vertex in graph B. Then if you line the graphs up this way and keep the edges uh, that are present in both graphs under that alignment, you get some other graph here. And the more, the more edges exist in this aligned intersection graph, uh, intuitively, the uh, better, uh, the higher quality this alignment is. OK. And so it turns out that it's not hard to show that this is actually the optimal statistic to decide whether or not uh, a particular alignment mu, or to determine uh, the posterior probability of a particular alignment mu. <clears throat> OK. So there's two minor or two important notational points to understand the next few slides that I have to make here. So the first thing is that if we look at a vertex in one of these graphs GA or GB that we observe, what is the uh, expected value of the average degree in the graph? So it's roughly the number of vertices times the probability that an edge appeared in the parent graph times the probability that that edge was sampled so that it appears in GA. Then if we look at the intersection under the true alignment, again, it has to appear in the parent graph, has to survive two sampling events in order to appear in the intersection graph. OK. <clears throat> and again, the important thing to, uh, to notice here is that th this is uh, this value is larger than it would be if uh, GA and GB were, uh, were independent. So the, yeah. So if you, yeah, OK. So I told you what happened in the perfect correlation case. So uh, if we want to approach this problem, how can we guess what effect uh, noise has on this problem? We can run a fairly simple experiment uh, to start here. So suppose that we want to know when the true alignment gives us the biggest, <coughs> gives us the intersection graph with the largest number of edges. Because that's how we're going to decide that it's uh, the true alignment. We're going to compute this number of edges and pick the, uh, pick the matching that maximizes it. So when is this mu a, at least a local optimum of this objective function? So it's pretty hard to tell when it's a global optimum, because without some clever algorithmic ideas, we just have to search over uh, all n factorial permutations, which we can only do for graphs up to a size about 8 or something. Uh, but we can check whether it's a local optimum in uh, quadratic time in n, because there are uh, if you choose uh, two vertices and exchange them, that's the minimal way to make an error. So we can run this experiment. We get this uh, nice trade-off curve here. And it, what it shows is that, uh, OK, so the first thing that you can identify is that when s is 1, in other words, the perfect correlation case, we see exactly what we expect from Wright's result. There's a sharp transition. When the graph is sufficiently dense, we don't make an error. The true alignment is a local optimum. Wright's theorem says it's actually a global optimum there. And below 1, with very high probability, there's some neighboring alignment that's better. And we see the same threshold phenomenon extending you know, all throughout, even in the noisy regime. OK, so having a, and a, the y-axis here, this is the density of the graph the graphs G, A, and G, B <clears throat> that you're presented with here. And so there's this trade-off between the level of correlation between the graphs and the density. So the first result I'm going to present you is the precise characterization of this trade-off. OK. So if these two random graphs are sparse and non-negligibly correlated. I'm going to explain what those are in just a minute, but uh, 
This other condition is the really important one. And the expected value of the average degree of this aligned intersection graph is at least log n. Then the map estimator, the maximum a posteriori estimator, which is the, the optimal estimator for exact recovery, is correct with probability approaching 1. So this naturally generalizes the uh, perfect correlation result, because in the perfect correlation result, this intersection is just GA. And it's, it's essentially uh, the, this is essentially the best thing that you could hope for in terms of uh, uh, the largest possible region where you might hope that you could recover, uh, recover this alignment. In that region, you actually can. OK, and so what sparse means is that the expected value of the average degree of the two graphs that we're presented with is a little bit sublinear. So this, this number is enormously larger than the scale that we're working with here. So this is a very mild condition. And this non-negligible correlation condition, again, it's a very mild condition. It says that <coughs> the edge density is at least a logarithmic factor larger than the edge density would be if these random variables were all independent. So this is a very small amount of correlation that enables this. So the takeaway here is that in an information theoretic sense, uh, this problem is not that hard. You need a very small amount of correlation before uh, alignment recovery is possible. OK. And we have uh, a matching converse theorem that shows that this, uh, this result is tight. When the expected value of the average degree is a little bit less than log n, then for any estimator, uh, any estimator for mu is correct with probability approaching 0. And so this is the threshold phenomenon. Above this threshold, you're almost always correct. Below this threshold, you're almost always wrong. And that is exactly, uh, so if you think about the plot here, one interpretation of this theorem is that this, uh, the condition that we checked in the experiment, whether the alignment was a local optimum, ends up being uh, the most important condition. Uh, <clears throat> I should just go, I forgot. Yeah, I have this. OK, so if you plot these together, you can see the convergence of this experiment to the theoretical result here. And as n gets larger, the black region expands to fill up the whole region above the blue curve. And so as I was saying, <clears throat> what this tells you is that the local condition that we checked by experiment is the controlling condition for when you can uh, successfully accomplish this de-anonymization task. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about how you actually uh, prove this. So here's, remember, uh, this is what our estimator actually does. For a particular candidate matching mu, we look at GA and GB, align them using mu, and then figure out how many edges there are in that alignment. And then this is some random variable here. It's integer value random variable. And so we get one of these random variables for every possible alignment. And as the alignments contain mistakes, the mean of this random variable shifts down. So the question is, when do we have enough correlation that uh, the true alignment here, which has the largest mean, is actually uh, takes the largest value on this long list of n factorial candidates. And so to understand this, we really need to precisely understand the tail behavior of all of these uh, edge count random variables. Uh, and that's, that is the main analysis task of this, uh, this proof. So here's the, the good news for this task. This is the sum of many indicator random variables. So we can hope that we have a concentration of measure phenomenon, and uh, these concentrate very tightly around the means. And, and, and thus, the only thing that matters is that you have the, the random variable with the highest mean is the largest value on the list. Bad news is that all of these edge random variables that we're summing up are correlated with each other. And they're also correlated with the edge random variables in the optimal alignment. So uh, it takes some work to understand what actually happens here. So suppose we have two matchings that we're going to compare. This is the true alignment mu star and some other candidate mu. 
You combine these two perm or the, you combine these two matchings, and it uh, gives you a permutation on the vertices. If you walk from UA to UB using one matching, then walk back using the other matching, you get this permutation. So this is a permutation on the vertices. Uh, all of the random variables in this problem are the, the edge indicator random variables. So there's another lifted permutation on the edge random variables. So here I've drawn the vertex permutation. If we look at these, the, the edges between these three vertices in this cycle of length three of the vertex permutation, there's another cycle in the edge permutation. And these, these uh, permutations interact with each, or the cycles of the vertex permutation interact with each other to form more cycles in the edge permutation. <clears throat> Overall, all of these dashed red edges are the ones that get misaligned by uh, this vertex permutation. It means that either one endpoint of the edge is misaligned or the other endpoint of the edge is misaligned. And so then the expected value of the uh, random variables, the indicator random variables in the intersection, is reduced because we're taking the uh, in order for the edge to be present, it has to be present in graph A and present in graph B. And these events, at least, are independent. Then in the, the remaining edges, these are aligned properly under the, uh, the, the edge random variable permutation. And so they have the uh, original distribution, the same distribution that they would have under the true matching. So they have a larger mean. So the important thing here is that the property of this random variable here, or the distribution of this random variable here, is completely controlled by this cycle structure of the, uh, the comparison between that matching and the true matching. Now we finally get a little bit of simplification in this problem, and we see that the contributions from each cycle in the lifted permutation are independent. So if you walk around one of these cycles in the, uh, the edge permutation, you're going to find other random variables that, uh, that you're correlated with. But every other edge random variable is independent. So now we have enough independence to do some analysis. And the only task that's left is to understand the distribution created by a single cycle. And it turns out that cycles of length two are the worst case. And this is not really surprising, because uh, uh, you can think of sort of the, the limit of infinitely long cycle in the infinitely long cycle limit. Uh, you never make it. You never loop all the way back around to have the dependence come back to hurt you. So by relating longer cycles to cycles of length two, we can analyze these random variables for arbitrary permutations, and we, <clears throat> we can establish the conditions under which the true, under which the true matching is the largest uh, candidate on the list. OK. So now I'm going to talk about the, uh, the partial recovery problem. So remember, the threshold for exact recovery is that this average degree is at log n. So if it's less than log n, exact recovery is impossible. But remember from the experiment that the, the barriers to exact recovery are, are local issues in the, uh, in the permutation, are, are permutations that are close to the truth. So we can hope that even when this average degree is smaller, we still have enough information to recover most of the permutation. And so <clears throat> it's helpful to think here about the analogy to the connectedness case. So this intersection graph is disconnected below the log n degree threshold. But it still has a giant connected component. Almost every vertex is part of, a, uh, is part of this giant component. And so we can hope that we can learn the true matching for everything except the small number of, disc of uh, vertices that are not in the giant component. So if we think about the uh, privacy motivation for this problem, again, a little bit. Partial recovery is, is much more relevant for privacy. Uh, even 
if we uh, are successfully able to match only a few users, that's still uh, a significant problem in terms of the, the privacy guarantees that we'd like to, survive, like to provide. So uh, while the exact recovery problem is more closely connected to previous work in graph theory and this graph isomorphism problem, the partial recovery problem is, is more relevant for the, the privacy application. And you'll remember at the beginning that I assumed that the two vertex sets were contained exactly the same users. And the partial recovery is much less sensitive to this uh, very unrealistic assumption. So in the exact recovery case, the, the estimator that we should use for the permutation was pretty clear. Uh, if you ju uh, in fact, the, the map estimator, which is the optimal estimator for the problem, was easy to derive and just use exactly. That's not true. Uh, that's no longer true for the partial recovery case. It's easy to derive what the optimal estimator is, but now it's extremely complicated. So I'm going to talk about an alternative uh, estimator we can use based on the k core of a graph, uh, and this is actually tractable to analyze and simpler to compute than, than the uh, the optimal estimator for partial recovery, and its performance is is almost as good as the optimal estimator. OK, so I just need this tiny bit of notation. So if we have a subset of the vertices of a graph, then, then G bracket S is the induced subgraph of G induced by S. The, the K core of a graph G is the maximal vertex subset such that the induced subgraph has minimum degree at least K. And so you can find the K core of G by just iteratively stripping off all of the small degree vertices. So first, we remove this degree vertex, degree zero isolated vertex. We can remove these degree one isolated vertices, but now this created another degree one isolated vertex in the remaining graph. So we remove that. Now we're left with the two core. If we remove the degree two vertices in this, now we create some new degree, some new low degree vertices. Remove those. We have the three core. Remove the degree three vertices. And now we've removed everything. So this graph has an empty four core and non-trivial 0, 1, 2, and 3 cores. The estimator that we're going to use for partial recovery is the k-core alignment estimator. So the k-core alignment estimator is the matching of the two vertex sets such that the aligned intersection that you get under this matching has a minimum degree k, just like a k core does. And then it has the same type of maximality property. You can't add any other uh, pairs of points to mu without destroying the minimum degree property. So it's uh, the, the biggest possible matching that gives us this minimum degree k property. And again, here's a simple example of a two core alignment that matches four out of the five vertices in these two graphs. It's not possible to match this, these stragglers here. So the first problem with this idea, oh, OK, so first I'll say uh, what the idea is ex explicitly. The k-core alignment estimator is to just pick, find some, some uh, k-core alignment, and then declare that that is the, uh, a subset of the true alignment. The, problem, uh, the first problem here is that this might not work well because k-core alignments are not necessarily unique. The uh, uniqueness argument based on vertex stripping that I gave for the k-core uh, does not generalize to this k-core alignment case. <clears throat> the k-core that, alignment that we're hoping to find is the one arising from the k-core of the aligned intersection graph, or the, the, uh, the intersection graph under the true alignment. So that definitely gives us one k-core alignment. If there are others, those could cause us to make mistakes. So we need to prove this theorem that when the correlation is sufficiently high, this is the only k-core alignment that exists. The, the one that we want, the one that comes from the true, that comes as a subset of the true alignment. OK, so now I'll give you the precise conditions of what enough correlation means. So this theorem has exactly the same structure as the exact recovery result. But what changed here is the degree requirement that we need. 
So now we need the expected average degree of this aligned intersection graph under the true alignment just to go to infinity. <clears throat> Remember, in the exact recovery uh, case, this was log n plus omega of 1. So when we have this condition, there's some parameter k, and you, you can compute this explicitly, uh, that, that has the following property. With high probability, that k-core alignment estimator is a subset of the true alignment, so it makes no uh, false positive mistakes. And it's big. It, it, uh, it contains a, almost n pairs of points, so we're matching almost everything. And again, we have a converse that shows that this is uh, uh, that this can't be improved. The converse applies not just to the k-core alignment estimator, but to any, any estimator of the true alignment. Either you're going to make some false positives, or you're not going to find a matching that includes almost n vertices. So that's a little bit tricky to say formally, but this is, this is how you do it. So I'm going to skip ahead through this uh, most of the, through a little bit of this uh, section about how you prove this converse. The only thing I'm going to say here is, is what's on this slide here, which is that the basic idea behind both the exact recovery converse and the partial recovery converse is that if we look at the automorphism group of the aligned intersection graph under the true matching, any permutation in this group will give us some good matching of the two graphs. So the automorphism group OK, and, and formally, good matching means that the number of edges, the number of edges in that uh, aligned intersection graph is at least as large as the number of edges in the aligned intersection graph under the, <coughs> under the true matching. So we always have an identity permutation in the automorphism group. And so this always gives us the, the true matching. If there's anything else in this automorphism group, we're going to get imposter matchings, and our estimator <coughs> will no longer be accurate. So this is, this is the main idea here. And you can see how this relates to, the, uh, relates to what happens in the graph isomorphism case, the, the perfect correlation limit of this idea. OK. And so recently, so this, uh, this line of work was inspired by work in the security community in 2009 that sort of applied this graph matching idea to de-anonymize, uh, to link, to associate users of uh, two social networks. The uh, information theoretic analysis of this type of problem started in uh, 2011. And since then, there's been uh, a rapid growth in interest in this problem. And just in the last, uh, the last few years, some people in the CS, CS theory community have gotten very interested in this and started pushing to find uh, independent or to find uh, efficient algorithms to actually estimate these alignments. So remember, my, uh, my argument about the information theoretic threshold allows us to use any algorithm, whether we can compute it efficiently or not. And the algorithm that I investigated is not, in fact, efficient. It involves just checking this uh, list of n factorial candidates. So there's been uh, a lot of progress on this in the last year, but there's still more to do. OK. So now I'm going to switch gears for a minute and talk about uh, a second problem uh, in adversarial machine learning. Now, let me see. Can you see the? I don't know whether it's a feature or a bug, but so these, these MNIST images have some uh, small noise added to them. And uh, you may or may not be able to see it. Uh, with a good enough projector, you can see it, but it's still not much noise. And modern machine learning classifiers are surprisingly vulnerable to carefully selected adversarially, adversarial noise. So the question that I'm going to, to talk about now is when is it possible to learn a classifier that doesn't have this weakness, a classifier that's robust uh, to this phenomenon? And if there's some amount of data that you need to learn a, a, a classifier that performs well uh, on the same, on natural data, the same data that it was trained on, 
or the same data from the same distribution that it was trained on. Do you need more samples than that to learn a robust classifier, or is, uh, do you just need a better training algorithm that takes this goal into account? And so this has important implications for the decisions that people make about which types of ML architectures to use. If it turns out that uh, you don't need more data, you just need to take this problem into account when it's relevant for your application, then, uh, then that's uh, a relatively minor change to current approaches. But if it turns out that this uh, type that demanding this type of robustness uh, has a significant, requires you to collect significantly more training data, uh, then that will force you, that will push you away from more complicated uh, architectures so that you can still achieve convergence with the amount of data that you actually have. And so the approach here is going to be uh, adapting a statistical learning to this setting. So here's the basic uh, learning problem. So we have some space. We have some data distribution over the space. We have some family of hypotheses, which are functions from the space to the classes. We get some training data sampled from the, the data distribution. We use this training data to select some member of our hypothesis class. We sample. Uh, and then we evaluate our performance like this. We sample new data. And we check whether we, when we use the learned classifier on the new data, whether or not it gives us the correct label. And this probability of error on uh, fresh data from the same distribution is our, is our loss function. So this is the standard setup. In the adversarial setup, the first part is the same. We still get training data, IID from some distribution that we'd like to, uh, to learn. The adversary comes into play at the second step here. So we sample uh, a new random, uh, a random test sample from the same distribution. And now the adversary has, uh, makes a small modification to this uh, sample x test to give us y test, some point in a, in a neighborhood around x. So now the new specification for the problem is this neighborhood function that constrains what the adversary is allowed to do. And now our new performance metric uh, tests whether we, have, we still have accurate classification when we run our learned classifier on y, the adversarially modified example, rather than the, uh, the clean random sample x. And of course, this reduces back to the original problem when you make these neighborhood sets trivial. So if the neighborhood of x only contains x, we're back to the original problem. So this is sort of a, just a, a smooth generalization of that. So now, let me, what does learnability mean from this problem? So HN is this classifier that we learned after we saw N training samples. And if, instead of learning from data, we knew everything there was to know about the, the distribution, instead of H hat, we would pick this other classifier, H star. Now, that classifier doesn't necessarily get everything right. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have a loss of 0. But if we know everything about the data, this is the best we can do. So the natural, uh, the natural measure of how well we're doing here splits our loss into two components. The optimal loss, so this is just the uh, hypothesis testing part of the loss. And then the penalty, the extra loss we incur, because we are in a learning scenario, where we had to select uh, H using only training data. So the penalty due to our incomplete knowledge. And as N increases, if this penalty converges to 0, that's when we say that learning is possible, or that this, uh, this scenario is learnable. And again, that doesn't, in general, this optimal loss will not converge to 0, especially in the adversarial setting. The optimal loss will not converge to 0. But learnability means that we converge with increasing amounts of data. We converge to the best possible performance. Uh, the sample complexity tells us this rate of convergence, the number of samples that we need to get within uh, epsilon of the optimal loss. You should say with probability 1 minus delta. And so pictorially, this is, this is the scenario here. 
as we increase the number of samples, again, this optimal classifier doesn't change, and hopefully the learned classifier is converging. So now there's two different scenarios that we'd like to distinguish in the adversarial case. When we add the adversary, clearly the optimal loss goes up. There are just some scenarios where the flexibility the adversary has to modify the sample causes us to make a mistake that we wouldn't make otherwise. And that's completely unavoidable. The question is whether the adversary also slows convergence to this optimum, or whether the convergence is essentially the same and it's just a worse optimum. So these are the two like qualitatively diff different scenarios that we'd like to distinguish. Uh, the key are, so the first technical idea here is that we should convert this to a scenario without an adversary. And we do this by converting our classifiers to degraded classifiers. So here's the picture like uh, that I showed before. We have some training examples and the adversary. If we're currently using this hypothesis here, the adversary will push the examples towards the boundary to cause us to make mistakes. So you can just compute the region where the adversary will succeed at uh, pushing examples towards the boundary, and then encode this whole process into a single function, uh, this region here, where uh, no matter what the adversary does to this example, we're still going to classify it as 1. This region here, where the same thing is true for negative 1. And this middle region, where the adversary can cause us to classify as 1 if the correct answer is negative 1, or cause us to classify as negative 1 if the correct answer is 1. So this middle region is the, the always wrong region. So once we make this uh, like simple transformation of the problem, the adversary is gone. And we have uh, a learning problem on this family of degraded uh, hypothesis classes. So in ordinary learning, one way to measure the complexity or richness of a, a family of classifiers is uh, the shattering coefficient. And the definition of, definition of a shattering coefficient, or the definition of shattering is, is the following. So if we have a list of examples and, uh, <clears throat> and then some target classification pattern that we'd like to achieve on that list of examples, and we'd like to send the first one to 1 and the second one to negative 1. So for every list of classes, we can find some hypothesis in our family that uh, hits the target for every example in the list. So when a, a hypothesis class shatters a list of examples, basically what that means, it has, it has no ability to identify patterns in the examples. No matter what the true labels are, the hypothesis class can say, yeah, that looks plausible. And you can't. And so no patterns can be uncovered in the data. It's only when uh, the number of examples is large enough that H no longer shatters them that uh, learning can occur here. So this can be adapted to, to our framework, and it requires only a, a fairly small change. So for a degraded family, now again, so the problem is we now have three outputs to our degraded classifier because we have this extra always wrong output. So it turns out that the right way to incorporate this into uh, the shattering idea is to say that we should have a list of labeled examples and say that we shatter when we can achieve every loss pattern. OK. And then the, the definition of adversarial VC dimension that this gives is that the adversarial VC dimension, now this is a property of the hypothesis class and the constraint on the adversary, whereas the ordinary VC dimension is just a property of the hypothesis class. This is the largest n where uh, there's, there exists some list of labeled examples shattered by H. This definition is then enough. At this point, we can apply sort of the standard machinery of statistical learning theory to get sample complexity upper bounds. And what we've done here is we found that in scenarios where ordinarily the one parameter that matters is VC dimension, now for us, the one parameter that matters is adversarial VC dimension. So uh, qualitatively, the question is, uh, when we added this bottom case, we have a new way to make an error. Uh, when we start looking at lists of examples, does this extra flexibility give us new ways, new error patterns that we can achieve in the adversarial setting that we never achieved otherwise? And again, if this is true, that would mean that the VC dimension would increase 
and the sample complexity would increase because we would need more data to get into the regime where non-trivial things can be non-trivial patterns in the data can be identified. And so the, the main result that I want to talk about here is that is to say that adding an adversary to a problem can increase or decrease VC dimension. And in fact, the strongest possible version of this is true. For any pair of dimensions, D and D adversarial, there's some example where the ordinary VC dimension is D and the adversarial VC dimension is D adversarial. So you can increase it by an arbitrary amount by adding an adversary. You can decrease it by an arbitrary amount by adding an adversary. And so in general, uh, so in full generality, you can say essentially nothing about whether adding an adversary makes the problem harder in terms of sample complexity. Our other result is actually in the extreme other direction, which says that for half-space classifiers, almost the simplest non-trivial classifiers, adding an adversary has no change to the VC dimension. The adversarial VC dimension is D plus 1 for both the ordinary case and the adversarial case. And here, the adversary is constrained to make changes that, uh, that are from some convex ball. And so this incorporates any LP norm and additionally lots of other stuff. So that setting uh, includes, uh, in terms of the adversarial constraint, the setting includes that everything that people work with experimentally plus lots more. Uh, Additionally, we can show that in this particular case, this actually exactly characterizes the sample complexity. This is not true more generally, but uh, this is kind of a subtle point that I can uh, talk more about later if anyone's interested in. OK, so now I'll talk about some future work in a few directions. So in, in privacy problems, there's lots left to do. In, uh, there's, there's all kinds of open problems in this area. So one of the most obvious directions is that I'm working with, uh, in the results I talked about today, I was working in a very idealized scenario. erdos renyi graphs, everything is as independent as possible. Uh, so like one, there's no time variation. These are like single snapshots of the data. So there's many uh, directions here to uh, perturb the problem and, and make it more realistic. The, the next thing is that, uh, so we made, I, I talked about some progress moving from exact recovery to partial recovery. What we'd really like to know about, from uh, a privacy point of view is, is like the weakest possible forms of recovery. When can you learn something non-trivial about the matching uh, given the amount of data? And so clearly that threshold will be lower than the thresholds that I was talking about today. But uh, in general, weaker forms of recovery uh, require more complicated estimators and more complicated analysis. So uh, in all of the work that I talked about here, I just uh, the estimator assumed that uh, we knew what the joint distribution that generated the data was. This isn't so bad in the, the graph case, because essentially the only f uh, feature that mattered for our, the, the graph case is that we knew that the correlation was positive. Uh, the, the magnitude of the positive correlation doesn't affect which estimator we used. So we just knew that when we see an edge in one place, it's more likely to exist in the other place. When you move from binary data to anything more complicated, uh, this assumption becomes much more limiting. And so then it's naturally interesting to ask whether you can do joint estimation of the, uh, the data generating distribution and the alignment. And then finally, uh, in terms of algorithms, uh, uh, one thing that I'm, I'm working on at the moment is, is trying to determine whether uh, uh, semi-definite programming-based algorithms can work all the way up to the information theoretic threshold. So semi-definite programming can be done in polynomial time with uh, as long as the size of the program is under control. And so this would show that in sort of a very crude sense, uh, the problem is efficiently solvable uh, in some regime. In practice, you do not actually want to use semi-definite programming algorithms, but they have insights that, you, uh, that are often useful for modification into to much faster algorithms. In the other direction, uh, one phenomenon that happens in these recovery problems in general is sometimes there's uh, a computational statistical gap 
There's a parameter regime where information theoretic recovery is possible, but under some complexity assumptions, no efficient algorithm can, uh, can solve the problem. And a standard uh, such assumption is that recovery of a planted click in, in a certain parameter regime is uh, computationally hard. So there, there's some reason to believe that a reduction, there, there are some connections between alignment recovery and planted click recovery, and some reason to believe that there, there's likely to be a region where there's a computational statistical gap. Then more broadly, uh, the information theoretic fundamental limits approach to privacy has some potential to provide a like, unifying point of view about, what, uh, about how to approach privacy guarantees, uh, the compatibility or incompatibility of different guarantees that we'd like to make. And so I'll continue to uh, look at connections between these different types of uh, properties from, from this approach. Uh, in adversarial machine learning, the, uh, we're able to characterize the VC dimension of, of the simplest possible case linear classifiers. So deep neural nets are, in one popular version, extremely complicated piecewise linear classifiers. And so there's, again, there's some reason to believe that, that our techniques can be made to work in this case. And uh, there's this issue that I briefly alluded to at the very end about uh, lower bounds on sample complexity. The approach that I talked about today gives us upper bounds on sample complexity, but we don't have matching lower bounds in every case. So one method that people are using in practice to, to try to produce networks that have this robustness properties is, uh, is a method called adversarial training, which is a essentially iterative generation of adversarial examples for the current version of your classifier and using those as training data to iteratively improve your, your, your classifier. This is closely related to adversarial empirical risk minimization, which is the, the approach analyzed here. So, so rigorously understanding that connection uh, is an important bridge between uh, the methods being used in practice and the, the guarantees that, that I can make about sample complexity here. And finally, there's, uh, I said that as you add an adversary, the performance of the optimal classifier always gets worse for this very obvious reason. And understanding, but understanding how badly it degrades is, is also important for uh, any practical application because you, you need to understand whether the amount of robustness you're asking for is, is reasonably achievable. And so you need to understand both this convergence aspect that I talked about today, but also uh, how bad the degradation of the, the uh, performance of the optimal classifier is. So uh, my collaborators on the work I talked, talked about today were uh, these six people, Pratik Mittal, uh, Vince Poor, Nagar Kiyavash. Uh, those are all professors. Uh, Arjun Bagoji and Osman Dai are graduate students. Uh, and Matthias Grossglauer, Grossglosser is a professor. And uh, so I'd like to answer any questions that you have. <laughs>